North Carolina has been searching for a power forward to replace Harrison Ingram. But what if you could replace Ingram with Ingram? You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Friday, May 3rd, 2024. It's my mom's birthday. Happy birthday, mom. I love you so much, dad. You better treat her right. Welcome into the Locked On Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you're joining us at the place to get your Tar Heels content every single day. I want to thank you for making us your first listen or watch. Special shout out to all you everydayers out there. Special shout out to all the great members of the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community. This episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side, and that side of me is a big old fan of Monopoly Go. The mobile hit twist on the classic Monopoly game. So join your friends right now and download Monopoly Go free on the App Store or Google Play. Coming up on the show today, we're going to just speculate a little bit about Harrison Ingram and what it would look like to maybe get him back. Jalen Withers, uh, it was announced on Thursday, is officially back, which we expected. But still, it's official. That's great. What's his role going to be? Brief updates on Cliff Amori, Cade Tyson, plus a Duke Barstool Twitter account being really dumb. And I got to share some thoughts. So... Here's the thing. I have been very vocal this offseason that I want Carolina to land a three, a four, and a five to replace all three starters that are gone. And I guess, frankly, I said the same about shooting guard if RJ decided to leave, but, you know, he didn't. (laughs) So of those three positions, the three, the small forward, check. What's up, Kate Tyson? Glad you're here. The five, Could be in the works literally as we talk with Cliff Omori on campus. But at the power forward spot, at the four, I haven't really begun to process the idea of what if you replaced the power forward spot with the guy who vacated it in the first place in Harrison Ingram. Now, by his own mouth, his desire, his intention is to stay in the draft. But we'd be silly not to at least think about the possibility and the reality that Harrison Ingram could come back. People pull out of the draft all the time if they don't get a first-round guarantee or they don't hear what they thought or they didn't land where they wanted to. Why not with Harrison? Now, I must confess to you, folks, You, if you're a regular on the show, if you're one of our everydayers, you know that I am an eternal optimist. I'm a glass half full kind of guy. I'm always looking at the positive spin on things. I guess that's what makes me just a little bit different in the sports media world. Cause I, you know, yeah, I'll be critical and I'll do those things, but I am kind of like, Hey, positive, happy thoughts, right? That's just me. It's who I am. But despite that, I really haven't given much of any thought to the idea of Harrison coming back ever since he committed to the draft. In fact, I did say on yesterday's show with coach Pat Kilby, look, there is a greater than 0% chance that Harrison does come back because that's true. That's reality. I believe that even if that's 1% chance, but I've never really given thought to the actuality of what that would mean and what it would look like. But here's the thing that I feel like I've started to notice a little more in the last couple of days. There's some whispers that have started to pop up. And I would normally dispel those and just cast them aside as complete rumor and fabrication. But they've been in the same vein as some of those whispers that started to pop up in the days before Seth Trimble ultimately pulled out of the transfer portal and came back. I am in no way saying that's what Harrison Ingram's about to do. But what if? But let me say, I still fully expect... Harrison Ingram to stay in the draft today, right now, as I record this. And there has been, hear me clearly on this. I'm not trying to put anything out there that's not out there. There has been nothing of substance or concrete enough information to dissuade me from Harrison Ingram staying in the draft or for me to say to you, hey, watch out for this. It might be happening. Make sure you are clear on hearing me on that. But isn't it fun to play a little bit? Dream about what could be. And like... While there's no concrete anything, here's something that happened, for example, 
on Thursday. Field of 68, you're probably familiar with these guys, cover college basketball extensively, do a great job, very well sourced. Um, and one of the main shows, Tyler Hainsborough's on their lot, John Henson's on their lot. One of their main shows coming from their founder and uh, I guess Jeff Goodman's co-founder, I'm not sure, but he's like second in command, at least with Rob Doster. Rob Doster started it. In comes John Goodman and John Fanta, who does a phenomenal job, mostly Big East stuff, but covers college basketball nationally. The three of them have a show. And on that show, they were talking about an updated version of their way too early top 25. That's all inconsequential. They're talking about Big 12 stuff. They get into talking about North Carolina, specifically Rob Doster says, I got a hot take for you. And basically says, look, Cliff O'Mori is on campus at Carolina right now. If they get him, I have to take very seriously North Carolina as the number, the second best team in the nation. But the bigger thing is that after that, he says, because think about it. They've got this whole lineup. RJ Davis is back. Harrison Ingram's back on and on and on. And he just says it as though it's a foregone conclusion. Jeff Goodman doesn't bat an eye about it. John Fanta is in the middle and is kind of incredulous to it. And in real time, I just assumed because of Doster's assumption of making, of, of saying that Harrison Ingram is back, but really he wasn't being incredulous because he didn't think it was a hot take. He said, yeah, I, I, even without Cliff O'Mori, I've got North Carolina that high. And, and this isn't a Cliff O'Mori conversation or a how good North Carolina conversation is right now. My question is, why are they assuming that Harrison Ingram's a foregone conclusion? I've got three possibilities for the answer to that. Number one, it's insider information that they have that none of the rest of us have uncovered yet. Very well could be that. Number two, did he just misspeak and neither Jeff Goodman nor John Fanta caught it or was any the wiser, right? Like just assuming that Harrison Ingram was still there or that he wasn't really going to stay in the draft, you know, that kind of thing without any real information. That happens too. Look, as somebody that talks all the time and for a living, I say dumb and stupid and wrong stuff all the time. And people call me out on it on YouTube comments or say I talk weird or something. I don't know. You know, like it happens all the time when you talk a lot. So I get that. He could have just misspoke. Or third, maybe he's just making an assumption like, hey, ultimately, I think Harrison Ingram is going to pull out and come back and, and we're just going to assume it right now. Those are kind of the three possibilities I could see. But I, I do want to say, play a little what if, right? What, what if Harrison Ingram does come back to North Carolina? Let's say that also you land Cliff O'Mori alongside with that. And at that point, I'd argue that, yeah, Carolina is a top five, if not top three, top two team in the nation right there with Kansas. And at that point, I'd also argue that you're done. You don't need anybody else because that's 12 of your 13 scholarships spent. Think about the starting lineup. You got three of your five starters back in Elliot Art, Elliot Cadeau, RJ Davis, and Harrison Ingram. And you add into that Cade Tyson, who last year was top two three point shooters in the nation, and Cliff O'Mori, who's going to dunk everything in sight that Elliot Cadeau lobs to him and then block everything on the other side of the floor. That's a great starting five and a starting five I'd put up with just about anybody in America, especially if Elliot Cadeau takes the sophomore leap that we all hope and expect he will. But then even your bench, this, like if you took the top five guys and the guys that, in my opinion, are the top five off the bench, they could compete in some mid-major conferences. The, the, the next five off the bench, in some order, Seth Trimble, Ian Jackson, Jalen Withers, Jalen Washington, and Drake Powell. And I believe legitimately with that, those 10, Carolina probably goes 10 deep next year, depending on how well Ian Jackson and Drake Powell adjust and how quickly they adjust to the college game. And I know they're uber talented guys. I'm not saying they're not. So I don't, I don't need all the comments about it. I'm just saying sometimes it takes guys a little bit longer. That's it. That's all I'm saying. And then I, in terms of Zayden High and James Brown, I would expect them to get minutes here and there, but to just not be as used as much as those uh, top 10 guys. Y'all, that's a lineup right there. Holy smokes. So, Yes, I am a proponent of landing a four, of landing a power forward. But if you're giving me the option of Harrison Ingram being that power forward, everyone else can go away. I want that man back in Chapel Hill yesterday. So we'll keep our eyes on it. Who knows if there ends up being any reality to that. But it is something that we at least have to think about and speculate and wonder about. Like, what if he comes back? Because that's a very possible reality. 
Now, I mentioned it earlier, and, and we expected this news, but on Thursday, it was officially announced that Jalen Withers is coming back. So I want to have a conversation about what's his role going to look like this year? We just unpacked a possibility of who the 12, maybe 12 scholarship players at Carolina are out of 13 scholarships that are available. How does, how does Jay Witt fit into all that? We'll talk about it in just a second. Right after I tell you about eBay Motors, passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits to LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed or power or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Why? Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you want at the prices you need, it's easy to turn that car into the MVP and bring home a win. So keep your ride or die alive right now at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. On Thursday... John Rothstein tweeted, quote, Jalen Withers tells me that he's returning to North Carolina next season and will use his additional year of eligibility, end quote. Hey, this is the assumption we've all had. Jalen Withers is coming back unless we hear noise to the other that he would be transferring or, you know, maybe test the draft waters because it is his last year. And why not? Right. Why not go through the process? Learn a little bit more about yourself. I get it. But with no noise, no news. And even though the transfer portal is closed. Remember that you could still hear names leaking out today, Friday, tomorrow, Saturday, even, you know, into early next week. I wouldn't be surprised if we heard another couple names. So while we expected it, this is good clarification from Jay Witt to know fully, truly he's back. And so because this was expected, I already had this uh, on our scholarship chart, Jalen Withers and RJ Davis, both back as fifth year seniors. Although this is actually Jalen Withers sixth year in college because he had had a redshirt year his first year at Louisville, then played three years, then came to Carolina, and then year two at Carolina. So that's pretty crazy. But again, get old, stay old. That's what Carolina's doing right now. And I want to say this. This is my, I, it's not even a hot take on it. It's just a, 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 a take. Good for Jalen Withers for staying. In a day and age when any dude can go anywhere he wants, any dudette can go anywhere she wants because of what the rules are now with transfers, there's just something to be said for people who are willing to stick it out, even if they're not getting the level of playing time or production that they either want to have or that they had previously had at another school. He could easily have left in search of more playing time, in search of a different or more integral role with a team. But no, Jay Witt, what, what this says to me is that this dude is bought in. He believes in what Hubert Davis is selling. And I don't mean that to sound like Hubert Davis is a, you know, a salesman going door to door selling you soap. See, I come buy my soap. No, it's like when I say he's buying what Hubert Davis is selling, Hubert Davis is selling North Carolina. Hubert Davis is selling a chance to be part of something bigger than yourself. Hubert Davis is selling a, a 40 year decision. And Jalen Withers is buying into that. He recognizes that this team could be something very, very special. And he wants to be part of it. Now, let me let me say something else about Jalen Withers. He had an up and down first year at North Carolina. We can recognize that. There were some really good moments. There were some really not as good moments. But unfortunately for him, in the same way that you know, a lot of what remains on people's minds about RJ's year last year was his 0 for 9 from 3 in the final game of the season. In fact, I had somebody in our YouTube comments this week when, when RJ announced he was coming back, it was just like all in on 0 for 9. It's terrible. Why is he coming back? You know what? It's like, come on, man. What are we, what are we doing? Do you recognize what this kid did for the this team last year? No, I got no time for that. But unfortunately for Jalen Withers, because of that decision he made to attempt that three-point shot late in the Alabama game, early in the shot clock, that is what people pin on him and, and his year last year. And let me say this. I, 
And the majority of us out there, I bet all of you out there listening or watching have been frustrated about that. Media and fans alike have been very critical of that three-point attempt. And we should be. It was not a good shot. It was not recognition of time and score and circumstance. And I got to be honest, it still haunts me. But with hindsight, I do recognize that there were a multitude of things that could have or should have happened from North Carolina in that game, or that ordinarily would have happened from North Carolina in other games throughout the season that would render that moment moot, where it wouldn't have mattered because it had he had the ball in that moment, Carolina should have been up seven to 10 points. But unfortunately, North Carolina played a C minus D plus version of themselves that night. Instead of, you know, even if they play a B version of themselves, they beat Bama by, by that seven to 10 point margin. And even playing a C minus D plus version, they still only lost by two. And so you look at that and say, man, Carolina's up one. They got the ball. But you think if RJ Davis hits one, three, if Armando Baycott makes that dunk, if, 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 if this whole litany of ifs that we could list off that would have rendered the Jalen Withers shot moot. And you know what I'm hopeful for, for this dude, he's coming back to North Carolina. I want some redemption for him. Like in, in a 2016 to 2017 sort of way for North Carolina, because this is, it's a self-inflicted thing. I'm sure he has beat himself up over it. I know he talked about it immediately post game. Like, Hey, coaches asked me to shoot there. I shot great. Cool. Get it. But I'm sure he's, he's been frustrated at himself. But what I want to look at and talk about is Jalen Withers role this year, because that, that bench is going to have more depth and depending on who comes in, the starting lineup is, is going to be great again as well. So he's going to have to fight even harder for every minute he gets. So what I want to look at is a possible ceiling for Jalen Withers, a floor for Jalen Withers, and then, a, and then what probably will be the reality. So the ceiling for Jalen Withers, and again, this is like dreaming. If he has like the best year of his life, best offseason, all that kind of stuff. Ceiling, he's the starting power forward. Again, I'm not saying that's the reality. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm saying that's the dream scenario. Starting power forward, 15, 20 minutes a game. What, eight, eight to 10 points, five to seven rebounds a game. Very consistent, very high level great decision-making, understands his role well and plays within that. Less dribbling allows others to do that, and then he makes the plays that are better for him. He's a madman on the offensive glass, put back after put back after put back. He uses his athleticism to frustrate opponents on the defense while playing within the team defensive principles. Gets to the free throw line two times a game. Um, gets up to, you know... I don't know, 80%. He had a career high 78% last year. Um, it, again, in this ceiling scenario, shoots 38 to 40% from three on two attempts per game. And, and that's not wild. He hit 41.7% on three attempts a year hit, or three attempts a game his junior year at Louisville. Last year, though, he shot 20% on half an attempt a game. So, um, and then... It, to round out that that ceiling, that dream scenario, 65% on twos, on two to three attempts a game. Last year, he was 62%. So again, it's not all that wild. But we don't always get to see the ceiling. What, what about a floor for Jalen Withers? Well, a floor would be there's just too much talent, too much manpower, and he can't get out of his own head about it. And he kind of gets buried on the depth chart and plays just, what, five to seven minutes a game, shoots 20% from three again, uh, down to 70% on free throws, which I know is still good, but it's not what he can do, um, is a poor decision maker, dribbles way too much, tries to do too much, plays not within himself. The, the turnovers creep up to over two a game, like what happened his junior year at Louisville. Like th those kind of things are the floor to me. But, but the reality, I think, is somewhere in between that floor and that ceiling. And the reality could be really good for what Carolina needs him to do. And that's critical. Everyone has to play a role. So in reality, here's what I think Jalen Withers is this year. And I'd love to hear your feedback on this. Are you with me? Do you think he plays more of a role, less of a role? Where are you at? But in reality, I would say he plays a critical part of bench depth 
Um, I, I think Carolina gets someone else at the four, whether it's Harrison Ingram back, like we speculated, or somebody else, but that he still plays in that 10 to 12 minutes a range. Keep in mind, of Carolina's eight-man rotation last year, it was he, Jalen Washington, and Seth Trimble as the main part of the bench rotation. And they're all back. And I expect them to still come off the bench because of, of the other pieces that Carolina has and that they've added. And plus, as I said, you add in Ian Jackson, Drake Powell, and James Brown, and you've also got Zayden High. So it's, it is a loaded bench. But in reality, I, I also expect him to play within himself a little more. I expect him to understand his role better than he did, especially in the early parts of last year where he's still trying to figure out who am I as part of this team. I expect him to cut his mental errors down to maybe one every two or three games. I expect him to dribble less and allow others to do that. I, I expect him to get to the offensive glass get a, an offensive rebound or two a game with a putback or two a game. When he was really shining down the stretch of last season, that's what he did so well. Attacked the offensive glass like a madman and got lots of putbacks. Like there was um, at Cameron right before halftime, right? You remember that? That was a critical part of Carolina uh, winning that basketball game. And then, you know, in terms of some stats, I expect five points, four or five rebounds a game from him, 60% from two, 35% from three to kind of average out. It's funny. He's kind of bounced back and forth every year of college so far. Go look at his stats and you'll see he's he's ping-ponged back and forth from really bad to really good to really bad to really good. Actually, it's flipped at that. He's started really good, really bad his sophomore year. The, his best three-point shooting is junior year, really bad last year. So if that continues, he's going to shoot great from three this year. And then I'd say 75% from the free throw line. All of that to me, is, is the reality of expectation for Jalen Withers. Again, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on that. Well, folks, got a grab bag for you to wrap up the show today. Updates on Cliff Amori, Kate Tyson, and a completely tone-deaf tweet from Barstool's Duke account. All that coming up in just a second. Right after I tell you about Monopoly Go. All right, look, game off, timeout. We got to pause and talk more about Monopoly Go. And I know what you're saying. Look, Isaac. Flag on the play. Come on, dude. You're already talking about this a lot, but there really is so much good stuff in this game that I want to tell you a little more. In Monopoly Go, you can team up with your friends for timed tournaments where you work together to build up your boards, and the more you win together, the more prizes you unlock. Here's some examples. Unique stickers that you can trade with friends to complete albums for big prizes. How about some cool new playing pieces you can use to travel the boards with? They've also got a hilarious set of emojis that you can use to taunt your friends when you smash their buildings or heist their vaults. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton of these include their own unique mini games like Digging for Treasure or a Robot Pinchinko Machine. And there's always new timed events that help you win big like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go. So get off the bench, go download and download it now for free at Google Play or the App Store. Game on. Got some updates for you to wrap up today's show. Let's start with Cliff Omori. This is the, the guy that everyone's looking at. This is a critical and crucial visit. It started on Thursday. And, and where I'm at, is that I'm so glad that Carolina was able to get Cliff Amore on campus. I'm so, I, I really, really was worried that he was going to go to Tuscaloosa and never make it out. <laughs> you know, would eventually go back to Rutgers, but like that was it. And so the fact that he came out and said, no, I'm still going to North Carolina and that's my last visit. And, and we're going to go and we're going to do that thing gave me so much encouragement. Because you know how good it is to get on campus. You know how good Hubert Davis is at being like closing the deal. So I feel very good about it. I'm not saying I feel very good that he's going to commit. I'm just saying the fact that he came to campus is a massive win for North Carolina. And for all those of you who are wondering, no, I was not able to go out of town. And so I apologize. Hashtag, if you know, you know. Um so hopefully I didn't screw us up there and jinx us by staying in town. Uh, the other bit of news uh, on, on Carolina's loan transfer that they've gotten a commitment from already, Cade Tyson. 
on Thursday, I believe it was, Tar Heel Illustrated, that's Andrew Jones and company, reported that Cade Tyson is going to report to Chapel Hill on May 15th. We'll be there to start workouts, be part of summer session. And so you love this. This guy's getting here early. I mean, as of today, May 3rd, that's just 12 days from now that Cade Tyson is going to be there. And so that's great to see. You think about last summer when Harrison Ingram, just because of Stanford's schedule, wasn't able to come till later in, in, um, in the summer prep. And so hopefully getting Cade Tyson in early like this is going to be huge for the Tar Heels. All right. Look, anytime that Duke people do things silly, we got to talk about it. So earlier this week, as you are very well aware, because of the great news, RJ Davis announced he was coming back to North Carolina. Uh, The North Carolina college, the UNC underscore basketball account tweeted, you know, the why not for kind of a profile picture of RJ and Duke Barstool quote tweeted it and said with weird capitalized and not capitalized stuff, where was he going to go? Kind of poking fun. Like, well, of course he came back. He wasn't going to go to the draft. And here's what's so insanely tone deaf about that. Both programs, North Carolina and Duke had a veteran guard that had one more year of eligibility that was essentially team captain. One of them, RJ Davis, decided to come back. The other, Jeremy Roach, went to Waco, Texas to play for Baylor. So where was he going to go? He could have gone to Waco. He could have gone to Baylor because that's what your guy, who is the exact same thing as RJ Davis, did. So why on earth would you be so dumb to tweet this? Because you know that everyone is, especially everyone from the Carolina fan base and a lot of other, you know, national people are going to come back at you and say, you dorks, do you not realize your own version of RJ Davis left? Because where was he going to go? Could have been asked about Jeremy Roach too, because he wasn't going to the draft either, but he is transferring out. RJ Davis is coming back. So what are we doing? So folks, if you haven't hopped on and, and, and given the Duke Barstool tweet crap about that, you have my permission. Hop in on that. Quick weekend whip around for North Carolina. Not a ton of action this weekend. Um, baseball is off this weekend. They had two midweek games. We, we I mentioned that yesterday where they blew out both opponents. So they've got just two more weeks of the regular season. Here's how that's going to play out. They host Campbell this Tuesday and then uh, host Louisville next weekend. And then the week after that, the final week of the regular season, they're at UNCW on Tuesday and then at Duke to uh, wrap up the regular season. So we'll keep our eyes on that. Right now, the Tar Heels lead the Coastal and have the second best overall ACC record. They're ranked 12th right now, but they're sixth in the RPI. So sitting in good position to be one of those eight national hosts for the Super Regionals. Just got to keep winning. Got to keep putting yourself in that position. Softball is off this weekend. They start the ACC tournament next week, midweek. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, Women's tennis and men's tennis are starting their NCAA tournament, NCAA championships today, Friday. So women's tennis is a host site. They're the number four overall national seed. The other three teams kind of in their regional are Navy and Wisconsin and William and Mary. So Wisconsin and William and Mary kick it off today at 3 p.m. Eastern, followed by the Tar Heels and Navy. The estimated time is 6 p.m. Eastern. The two winners play on Saturday at 6 for the chance to go on to the Sweet 16. So keep your eyes open for that. The men are in the Knoxville Regional, where Tennessee is the number seven national seed. Uh, The men play Memphis today at 10 a.m. So depending on when you're watching or listening to this, uh, they might have already played and we know the result. The winner plays the winner of Tennessee and ETSU. That's East Tennessee State University, which quick connection there is in the, essentially in the same town where Milligan is, where Coach Rob is the head coach. So just some fun stuff there. Women's golf NCAA regionals start Monday at Auburn. Keep your eyes out uh, for that. The men's golf team has another week or so before they get back into action. All right, gang, it's been another great week here on Locked on Tar Heels. I cannot thank you enough for everyone who joins us all the time. It's an absolute blast to be part of this, and I hope you love it as much as I do. 
Uh, we'll be back with you on Monday unless news breaks this weekend, whether it's Cliff Amore, good or bad. Uh, we'll probably need to talk an update on that or anything else that might come out. If you're not part of the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community where you'd get updated on all that information even before I can go live, make sure you do that. The link is in the show notes. It's free to join. We'd love to have you. If you haven't subscribed to the show, you need to do that as well. On audio, you can do it. On YouTube, just click the little subscribe button in the bottom right corner. And by the way, hit the bell notification so you get notified when I go live, which will happen as soon as more roster news breaks. It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Can't wait to talk to you on Monday, but until then, peace. Peace.